I'm going to return at the outset of this programme to the topic of the resignation of Victoria Newland from the State Department. I do so because um, after I did my video yesterday, more information started to trickle out and um, I've now had an opportunity to read properly the statement that the Secretary of State, Tony Blinken, provided um, following, well, confirming her resignation. And it's also clear to me that um, certain things had previously happened over the preceding weeks, which I'd missed and which led to my making um, a mistake in my programme yesterday. Now, in my programme yesterday, I referred to um, Victoria Newland as the continuing acting Deputy Secretary of State. And in fact, if you actually go to the statement itself, the statement that, um, the, um, that Blinken made, um, it actually referred to the fact that she was that she had served as acting uh, deputy secretary of state. Uh, it refers to her principles that she has brought to her work as under secretary and as acting deputy secretary of state, a role she filled seamlessly for seven months. The use of the past tense filled filled ought to have alerted me to the fact that at the time of her resignation, she was no longer acting Secretary of State, Deputy Secretary of State. In fact, I understand that she was passed over um, on the 12th of February and ceased to be acting Secretary, Deputy Secretary of State on that day, and that the post was instead given to Kurt Campbell, um, an experienced uh, diplomat, a highly qualified official with uh, lots of academic qualifications, a person who in some respects um, gives the impression of being rather more suited to this role than Victoria Newland herself. The fact is, however, that for seven months she was acting Deputy Secretary of State. And as a former bureaucratic warrior myself, somebody who's been involved in bureaucratic battles, admittedly in a completely different um, political culture than the one in the United States, I would say that in my experience at least, at least in my particular bureaucratic culture, if somebody is given an acting role, then normally they would be expected to see that, that acting role become permanent unless there were clear indications right from the outset that it was otherwise and that somebody else was being considered for the post. Um, there are reports in the American media that, in fact, Newland was um, annoyed about the fact that she was passed over for the position of uh, Deputy Secretary of State, and that this may have been one of the factors that led up to her decision to resign. Now, I'm going to say more about both Kurt Campbell and John Bass later in this program. John Bass is the person who has taken over um, the post that um, she was, Newland was holding um, at the time of her resignation, which is Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs. Kurt Campbell, as I said, has taken the more senior post, the more important post, which is Deputy Secretary of State. Now, let's go, first of all, to Blinken's statement. And um, there's a number of interesting things about the statement. First of all, there's no doubt at all 
about the warmth of the statement. It's clear that Blinken holds Newland in high regard. He speaks about the fact that she, he's known her for 30 years. He says all sorts of very favourable things about her. And I've no reason to doubt at all that Blinken sees, sees himself as a friend of Newland's. And of course, that is unsurprising, given the views that the two are known to hold. But let's start with the title. It begins with the words, on the retirement of Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs, Victoria Newland. Now, the key word here is retirement, because the, the word retirement effectively closes off the option of Victoria Newland ever returning to the State Department. Now, bear in mind that Victoria Newland has left the State Department once in the past. She was um, an important official in the State Department, in Bill Clinton's administration, in um, George W. Bush's administration, um, in Barack Obama's administration. She was a central figure in the State Department in all of these administrations. She was Chief of Staff to Stove, Talk, Stove Talbot in the Clinton administration, um, Chief Foreign Policy Advisor to Dick Cheney, the Vice President in the George W. Bush administration, and of course she was uh, Assistant Secretary of State for European Affairs and other, and also holding other posts at various times in the Obama administration, and I discussed yesterday her career. She then, however, left the State Department when Donald Trump was elected. Um, but she returned to the State Department after Donald Trump's presidency ended and returned when Joe Biden became president. Now we are told that she has retired and when people retire, they haven't just resigned, they are essentially saying that they're going into retirement, which is a sign that they're not ever coming back. Now, someone, therefore, either Newland or conceivably someone else in the State Department, in the US government, doesn't want her to come back to the State Department. Now, why did I just add the qualification that it was either Newland or someone else who doesn't want Newland coming back to the State Department? Because the next, the first line of Blinken's statement itself doesn't refer to Newland telling him that she intends to retire. It says this, Victoria Newland has let me know that she intends to step down in the coming weeks as Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs. So, according to this statement, what Newland told Blinken was that she was intending to step down in other words, resign, which is not exactly the same as saying that she intends to retire. Now, maybe I'm reading too much into this, but again, to a bureaucratic warrior like myself, somebody who's a grizzled veteran of bureaucratic battles, there is a certain discrepancy in the words here. And, by the way, there is a tension within the statement itself, because it says that, the first line says that she intends to step down in the coming weeks as Under Secretary for Political Affairs, but then at the end of the statement we learned, I have asked our Under Secretary of State for Management, John Bass, to serve as acting Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs 
until Torrius, that's to say Newland's replacement, is confirmed, those last words might be taken to mean by some that Bass is now fulfilling Newland's role, in which case, of course, Newland's intention to stay in post for several weeks is no longer operative. She's actually, well, gone through the door and Bass has already taken over. Now, again, I might be reading more into this statement than it intends, but again, the words do suggest to me a possible tension here. Anyway, there's an awful lot then about the um, qualities of Victoria Newland and her many major successes. This is what you would expect in a statement of this kind. Remember, as I said previously, that uh, Blinken is clearly a friend of Newland's. But we then have comments like this. What makes Toria truly exceptional is the fierce passion she brings to fighting for what she believes in most. Now, fierce passion can be a compliment, indeed a commendation, but it might also, again, to some people in the bureaucracy, people who know, know her, suggests that she's a difficult person to get on with. That is, at least in the bureaucratic world that I once inhabited, what words like that, fierce passion, might, might imply. And then further down, we have um, a really interesting comment like this. She finds light in the darkness, she makes you laugh when you need it most and always has your back. Always has your back? Why mention that at all? Why bring that up in any way? Might it be again? Because on occasion, some people have found that she has not had their back that in fact, again, it hints at the fact that she's a rather tough bureaucratic fighter. And we also read that she always speaks her mind to my benefit and to the benefit of our foreign policy. This after talking about her diplomatic skill, that she always speaks her mind, might suggest that within the State Department, she doesn't exercise quite so much diplomacy, that she's outspoken. And this, of course, takes us back to the point about her fierce passion. And then lastly, we read that we're so grateful for Toria's service and for the lasting mark she's made on this institution and the world. Obviously, they're an acknowledgement of her immense importance in the formation of American policy, but also perhaps a hint that she has perhaps overstepped the mark in some ways. Now, I want to stress again, I'm reading this from a British perspective, and not just from a British perspective, from a, from a perspective of the bureaucracy that I once worked in, or ra rather was a um, on the fringes of um, people who know Newland might read this completely differently and it might be read entirely differently in the United States. Um, but then again, <laughs> perhaps not. I've tended to find that bureaucracies around the world can sometimes be surprisingly alike. And of course, again, it may be that people who know Newland read these words about fierce passion, always speaking her mind, always having your back, and read them 
with the same, shall we say, skepticism that I bring to this statement. Just say. Anyway, one thing is indisputable, that the people who are taking over from Newland, who are starting to fill the key positions in the State Department, people like Kurt Campbell, are people whose primary focus is on China, not on Europe, and who are perhaps rather more sceptical about the whole direction of US policy in Europe and the overcommitment to Ukraine. And I suspect, and I'm not the only person who thinks this, I should say, I suspect that the same is also true of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. The new chair of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the man who's replaced General Milley, General Brown, is an Air Force officer, and I've read in various places in the past that his primary concern is the challenge from China in the Pacific, and that he prioritises that as an issue of concern over the conflict in Ukraine with Russia. So this is what I personally think has happened. I think that last year, when Newland was at the peak of her influence in the, in the State Department, when it seemed as if the situation in Ukraine was going well, after the Kharkiv and Kherson offensives, when Mark Milley, a soldier rather than an Air Force person, and somebody, therefore, who is more concerned about ground war than about naval and air war, as one would expect from somebody focused on China. Anyway, Newland and Milley worked together prioritise Ukraine to ensure that Ukraine got all the weapons it was asking for in order to launch its great offensive in the summer. The offensive went disastrously wrong and um, was defeated by the Russians. I have um, discussed previously how um, there were already stirrings, murmurings in the United States. There was a whole succession of Rand Corporation Arctic, um, um, papers by people like Samuel Charup, for example, various articles in foreign affairs, um, concerns from people like Richard Haas of the Council of Foreign Relations that the United States was getting itself involved in a long war in Ukraine, which was not in US interests. I also remember discussions going all the way back to 2022 about unease on the part of the Pentagon, about the overcommitment to Ukraine. And I get the sense, this is my own view now, I want to make it very clear that I'm not basing this on actual information by definition information of this kind unless you have sources high level sources in washington which by the way i don't but information of this kind by definition is hard to come by but my sense fairly early on in the ukraine war in the summer of 2022 was that the pentagon at least some people in the pentagon were always more sceptical about the value of the Ukraine ex um, enterprise. They felt that it was a diversion from the real conflict, which was the one with China. They went along with it, the Ukraine enterprise, um, at the outset because they were assured that it would be relatively short and that the Russians would be quickly defeated and that the commitment that the United States would therefore have to make would be a limited one. But I suspect that sometime in the autumn, they began to become, these same people in the Pentagon, began to become impatient, and <laughs> criticism 
within the government, or perhaps not exactly criticism, but discussion within the US government about the depth of the US commitment to Ukraine began to grow. And we can see again that there would have been pushback, pushback probably from people like Victoria Newland. There was an article that I remember discussing, which was published by the Institute for the Study of War, a um, entity that, of course, Newland is closely involved in. It appears to be run by members of the Kagan family, into which Newland his, herself has married into. Anyway, I remember a very interesting article that appeared in the Institute of Study of War, which I discussed in an earlier programme, discussing the importance for the United States of gaining control of the Black Sea, how that would gradually push the Russians back, whereas, of course, if Ukraine went down to defeat, the United States would be obliged to build up its military forces in Europe and to keep a large proportion of its relatively limited fleet of stealth fighter jets, F-35 fighter jets in Europe to withstand the Russians, which by definition would mean that they would not be available for deployment in the Asia-Pacific region and in places like the South China Sea. And looking back, I wonder whether that article was a public expression of arguments that were taking place within the bureaucracy. The China hawks becoming increasingly frustrated by an open-ended, the open-ended nature of the commitments to Ukraine, starting to push back and say that enough was enough and that the United States would have to refocus on the time had now come for the United States to refocus on China and people like Newland trying to argue that the conflict in Ukraine still maintained its importance, that abandoning Ukraine would weaken the US's overall strategic position and far from reducing American commitments in Europe, a defeat in Ukraine would require that those commitments instead be increased. And what may have happened, and I want to stress may, because again, this is all speculation, and I want to make it clear that I accept that. But what may have happened is that at some point, last seven months, the decision was made to promote Newland to the position of Deputy Secretary of State. There was opposition from various people in the permanent government, including the China Hawks, who were worried that she was becoming obsessed, or rather was obsessed, with Ukraine. The China Hawks won. She was she lost the job, the job of acting of, De of deputy secretary of state was instead given to Kurt Campbell, and Newland's position within the bureaucracy from that moment on began to slip, as the United States began to reprioritize reprioritize towards the conflict in the Asia-Pacific region. And Newland, who is herself a veteran bureaucratic warrior, and by the way, by all accounts that I've heard, a very effective one, would have sensed this, and probably she would have experienced the usual games that are played against people who are on the losing end of bureaucratic battles meetings that you're not 
invited to, papers that you don't receive, decisions that you're that are made without you being consulted about them, things of that kind. Much worse things can happen also, by the way. It's been done to me. I should know. Anyway, um, Mullen, who is an experienced bureaucratic fighter, probably sensed that the writing for her was at some point on the wall and eventually took the decision that it made better sense for her to go rather than be pushed out. Something which, by the way, everyone in the bureaucracy would probably have preferred. Blinken himself, again, this is my reading of this statement, was probably unaware of all of these tensions um, and of the problems in Newland's position, because the statement suggests to me that he was taken by surprise by Newland's decision. Anyway, that's my own personal reading of the situation. It can, I accept, be read differently, but it is how I read it. And as I said, I do bring a certain experience to this, though I accept again that as the bureaucratic culture in the United States may be different from the one I know, um, it may be that the experience that I do have is of limited relevance. One last point I'm going to make, and it's one that I have decided to speak about with a certain degree of misgivings. But one thing I will say is that a number of people have been noticing that there has been a relatively recent change in Newland's appearance. Now, that is all I'm going to say about that, because, well, it's a sensitive topic, which I don't think one should overstress. But I will say this again. Bear in mind, this has happened to me. When people are involved in bureaucratic battles and are at the losing end of bureaucratic battles, one visible sign of that can be a change in their appearance. Just saying. So, that's, I think, all I'm going to say about Victoria Newland. She's not coming back to the State Department. Um, the China Hawks are now in charge of the State Department. They're also in charge of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. I suspect that before long, we're going to have a new Secretary of Defence, possibly after the election, definitely after the election, of course, if Donald Trump wins, but possibly after the election, even if President Biden or the Democrats win the election in November. But... And I suspect that that person could also turn out to be a China hawk as well. One way or the other, it does look to me as if the permanent government of the United States is now refocusing on China rather than on Russia. And this, of course, is a debate that goes all the way back to the first days of the Biden administration, there was that astonishing article in the Atlantic Council, which um, I vividly remember, though I believe the person who wrote it has actually left the US government but still has influence. Anyway, there was an astonishing article in the Atlantic Council website just after the new president, President Biden, was inaugurated, which emphasised that the main challenge was indeed China. It's to, indeed, I remember that it spoke about President Xi Jinping specifically in the most virulent terms. And this article suggested that the priority had to be to divide 
Russia from China, to split away Russia from China, and that might even involve a willingness to make concessions in Europe to the Russians. Well, of course, Victoria Nuland, with her fierce passion, would have opposed that, and as we know, for a time she prevailed, but it looks like that way of thinking is once again in the ascendancy. Now, a number of points, however, must be made. The first is, and I've made this point before, we're not looking at moderates or realists taking over the conduct of US foreign policy from hardliners and neocons. All that has happened is that some people, Victoria Nuland specifically, who are focused viscerally on Russia, are being replaced by people who are focused on China. There is going to be continued conflict, but the conflict is going to be more with China than it is with Russia. At least that is what these people who are now being shunted in to top bureaucratic positions in the State Department and the Pentagon want. That's one thing we can be certain of. The other is, and this is unfortunately true of the US government generally, is that these battles are never finally and fully resolved. The China Hawks have won perhaps a victory over the Russia Hawks with the departure of Victoria Nuland, but the Russia Hawks are still there. One of them, I have no doubt at all, is the president himself. And the team around him, Blinken, Tony Blinken, and um, Jake Sullivan, they come across to me as being as hostile to Russia as ever, and as one of the most insightful commentators that I know pointed out to me in an email that I received today, um, these people, the Biden team collectively, are too um, embubbled, was her word, um, to understand that things are changing in Ukraine, and for that reason, um, they're probably going to be extremely unwilling to change course on Ukraine as well. They will continue to press to pressure Congress to provide further, to authorize further funding for Ukraine. They're going to want to pressure the Europeans to step up to the plate to provide further funding and support for Ukraine. They're going to scrabble around to find more money within the Pentagon to provide Ukraine with attack and missiles. They're going to continue to do all of that. And they are probably, even without Newland, impervious to any discussion of the fact that the war in Ukraine is being lost. Just saying. So, the battle within the administration, within the US government, is not over. Briefly, it never is. But the departure of Newland probably has changed the balance of forces within that government. Now, I would just finish this discussion of this issue by adding that something like this has happened before, back in the 1960s, the late 1960s and early 1970s. Um, one of the factors which caused the US to reassess its policies with respect to the war in Vietnam is that some people within the Pentagon, and I think this is accepted history, some very senior people within the Pentagon, the people who were prioritized on the nuclear arms race 
with the Soviet Union were becoming concerned that the United States was over-investing in Vietnam and was becoming diverted from what they saw as the main challenge, which was the Soviet nuclear build-up, which the United States needed to match. And these people did play a role, a significant role, in causing the gradual shift in US policy away from commitment to the war in Vietnam and a refocus both on nuclear weapons strategy, but also, and this should also be said, on seeking arms control treaties with the Soviet Union. So, just making these points, uh, as I said, there is some historical um, foundation to this as well, but of course history never repeats itself. There was somebody, some wise person, some some time once said it does occasionally <coughs> rhyme, and well, anyway, in the past, I've made certain, I've drawn certain parallels between the American commitment to Vietnam in the 1960s and early 1970s and the commitment that the United States this time has been making to Ukraine. Now, if I am right about some of this, it is likely that the Europeans are getting hints of it. They're probably, in fact, they're definitely a lot better informed about any discussions of this sort that are going on in Washington than I am. I mean, they will have sources in Washington. <clears throat> they will have access to information from people there. They will know who is up and who is down because it's plausible that American officials and friendly journalists discuss these matters with them. That, of course, will, to a great extent, be shaping their decisions. And I've discussed over the last couple of weeks the clear signs of panic and alarm that have been spreading across Europe, of which we continue to see multiple signs. And I think if it is indeed the case that the China hawks within Washington are winning out over the Russia hawks, well, that in itself... <coughs> taken together with the deterioration of the situation for Ukraine on the front lines would be enough to cause the panic. Briefly, the Europeans, however antagonistic some of them might be <clears throat> towards China, are always going to be more focused on Russia because Russia is the rising superpower in their neighbourhood. Now, I say the rising superpower, probably <clears throat> at the start of this crisis, current crisis, in February 2022, they didn't think of Russia as a rising or potential superpower. They tended to discount the scale diversity and strength of its economy and they appear to have had a rather low opinion of its armed forces, a low opinion which the events of the first few weeks of the special military operation, widely misunderstood as they were in the West, would probably have reinforced. Now of course, today, they are under no such doubts. <clears throat> They have seen how the Russian army conducts operations on the battlefronts. They have noticed its size and scale. And they've also been forced to acknowledge the scale of Russia's manufacturing and industrial capacity. And 
of the size and sophistication of its economy and of its ability to withstand the sanctions shock that the Europeans, together with the Americans, organised against it. So, this venture, which they embarked on in February 2022, unlimited support for Ukraine, the plan to defeat Russia. Um, I remember Boris Johnson making a speech in the British House of Commons that Russia, uh, that Russia must not only fail in Ukraine, but be seen to fail. All that rhetoric, well, all of that is now going horribly wrong. And the Americans do seem indeed to be showing increasing signs of walking away. And of course, we have those signs in the scepticism in Congress. And it's important to say that people like J.D. Vance, for example, are also highlighting the issue of China over that of Russia. So one can see a certain commonality of views between Republican opposition to an open-ended American commitment to Ukraine with the likely opposition from within the bureaucracy to such an open-ended commitment to Ukraine as well. Anyway, the Europeans are seeing all of this. They will have read that extraordinary article in the New York Times, which, as I said, everyone who understands these things, the various people in the intelligence community, they've all come and both privately in emails to me and in the case of Larry Johnson, publicly, they've all said the same thing, that the article in the New York Times, with its disclosure of what would have been secret information about American activities in Ukraine, is an indicator <clears throat> that the United States is starting to think of walking away. So the Europeans will have seen all of that and thus the panic because they've now got an angry bear stalking their neighbourhood, if I can use that metaphor, which I suspect they're all busy saying to each other. A bear which they have needlessly and pointlessly provoked and made very angry with themselves and they're now worried that the Americans who they relied upon to protect them from the bear might not be there <laughs> and that's why they're all scrabbling around and talking to each other about what to do and of course they've been urged to do all kinds of things by people like Victoria Newland <laughs> from the United States before she left. Her last throw as the bureaucratic battle began to go against her was probably to urge the Europeans to step in and take over the support of Ukraine from the United States and to start providing the weapon systems and such things to enable Ukraine to continue to conduct the war. Almost the last public act as Under Secretary of State, not uh, for political affairs, not as Deputy Secretary of State, acting Deputy Secretary of State, was to go to Kiev, um, where she presumably, in fact, I'm sure, undoubtedly played a role in the uh, fall of Zaluzhny and the appointment of Sirsky but where she also appears to have discussed with the Ukrainians the project for long-range missile attacks on Russia. She broadly hinted at that in the rather strange press conference that she gave. I'm sure that she's the person who's been encouraging the Germans and the British to think along these lines. <clears throat> 
and well we see that people in Britain especially have been keen on that idea some people in Germany seem to be keen on that idea also others like Olaf Scholz much less so it seems but anyway the Europeans have been receiving some encouragement from people in America like that but beyond that they will have been worrying about what to do themselves. Talk to the Russians is taboo. Talk from the Americans. Talk to the, uh, with the Russians from the Americans is also taboo. We've just had um, an extraordinary, boorish example from the Europeans of their complete unwillingness to talk to the Russians. Um, a few days ago, the Russian Foreign Ministry um, wanted to call in EU foreign ministers to make clear to EU foreign ministers, or rather, sorry, not EU foreign ministers, EU ambassadors in Moscow. It wanted to call them into the foreign ministry to give warnings to the ambassadors against any EU interference in Russia's forthcoming presidential election. And incredibly and shockingly, the EU ambassadors declined to respond. In fact, there are even reports that they refused to take calls. Now, that is an act of contempt towards a host government that is off the scale. And I have to say that... I'm surprised that the Russians have taken it lying down. I would have expected that in such a situation, ambassadors who behaved in that kind of way, refusing a request from the host government for a meeting in the foreign ministry, that the host government in that case would inform the ambassadors that they should return home. The Russians didn't do that. Perhaps they don't want the EU to retaliate against Russian ambassadors in the EU to EU states. I still think that the Russians ought to have done that. This is one instance where I have to say I thought I think that the Russians perhaps acted more softly than they should have done. That's my view. Anyway, what, the, what this incident shows is that there continues to be a policy of omerta, of refusal to speak to the Russians, to um, have proper contacts with them, and perhaps the Europeans were actually daring the Russians in effect, to tell them to leave, which, of course, the Russians chose on this occasion not to do. But the point is, still an absolute refusal to talk to the Russians. But if they're not going to talk to the Russians, given the course of events from the Ukrainian battlefields, well, what do they do? And we've now had those calls from President Macron for European troops to be sent to Ukraine, though not apparently in some kind of combat role. We've had a fiery, and in my opinion, unbalanced speech from the Czech President Piotr Pavel. I suspect that Pavel feels especially insecure in the positions that he's taking. Because I suspect that in terms of Czech opinion, he's starting to go out on a limb. There is strong support for e the EU and the West in Prague, to my knowledge, within the Czech Republic. But the Czech public generally has been fairly divided on this issue. And we've seen that in Slovakia, the mood has gone in the absolute opposite direction as has been confirmed by the recent electoral victory of Robert Fico. So anyway, 
Pavel has made an astonishing speech saying that the Europeans need to lose their fear of Putin. It's always Putin. And they must stop behaving like cowards. And he doesn't make it exactly clear what exactly he means by that or what the Europeans should do. But it's difficult to construe these words of President Pavel's as anything other than a um, call, in effect, to back Macron's demand for French or rather European troops to be sent to Ukraine. Macron, as I understand, was recently in Prague. He actually visited Prague and would have spoken to Pavel, and it looks like he worked him up in some way. So that seems to be the story there. I still think myself that it is most unlikely that we are going to see European troops be deployed to Ukraine. As various people have been pointing out, Stephen Bryan has a good article about all of this in Asia Times. The reality is that European armies, having already been weak before this conflict began, and having weakened themselves still further by transferring all of their best equipment, or in many cases their best equipment and their ammunition to Ukraine, are in no condition anyway to take on the Russians in Ukraine, a fact which President Macron and perhaps President Pavel don't seem to understand. Um, of course, it could be, as some are suggesting, that President Macron and President Pavel imagine that if Western troops enter Ukraine, then the Russians won't dare to attack them, that any threat from the Russians to do so is merely a bluff. For the record, I don't believe it is a bluff. I think the Russians have every incentive and reason in that case to treat those Western troops in Ukraine as combatants, in which case I suspect that they will attack them and they have the means to do so, in which case I also suspect that there will be a massive reaction in a completely negative way against this project from the European public itself. But anyway, all kinds of, as I said, hair brained schemes of that kind. And the Europeans are also moving forward with President Pavel's other harebrained scheme, which is to try to buy shells from various third countries. 800,000 shells, 500,000, 155 millimeter shells, and, and 300,000 122 millimeter shells. This is a plan, and apparently, whilst he was in Prague, Macron, who up to then had insisted that all funding for purchases of shells should take place within the European Union, apparently, he finally agreed that the European Union could indeed go to third countries and try to buy shells there. Now, I've already discussed in a previous video why this plan is not going to work in the way that the Europeans, or at least the European leaders, appear to think that it will. That going around the world to the international, especially to the international arms market, to buy shells in this kind of way is simply going to result in the cost of shells rising as the arms traders look to make the biggest profit that they possibly can. And of course, the provenance of shells required in this way and the condition of these shells, well, all of that is open to doubt. So there is a strong likelihood that the Europeans will spend a huge amount of money buying shells that are in a poor condition at an exorbitant price 
But we've had recently information which suggests, at least to me, where the Europeans are looking to buy these shells from. Now, I discussed recently a somewhat mysterious visit that President Zelensky made to Saudi Arabia. And again, one of my invaluable sources pointed out to me a possible explanation for this visit because Saudi Arabia has huge stockpiles of 155 millimeter shells, perhaps 500,000 of them. And maybe those are the 500,000, 155 millimeter shells that President Pavel is thinking about. Now, I understand from this source, I might be misreading or misunderstanding what he said, that most of these shells date from the first Iraq war, the one that the United States and its coalition conducted against Iraq in 1991 to liberate Kuwait from Saddam Hussein. And very large stockpiles of shells were then built up in Saudi Arabia in case there was a threat from Iraq again, or at least that was the reason that was given. And of course, those shells have presumably remained there ever since. Well, that was more than 30 years ago. And I don't know what condition these shells have been stored under, but I do wonder whether they're on, they would by now be in usable condition. Um, perhaps, perhaps not. But of course, there's the further issue, which is that would the Saudis actually be prepared to sell these shells to the Europeans to be used against the Russians? Saudi Arabia is apparently now definitely a BRICS state. The Saudis received Putin in a sort of triumphant way just a few weeks ago. The Saudis and the Russians have just cooperated with each other. They've just cooperated once again on further production cuts, oil production cuts. So it looks as if the Saudi-Russian oil alliance remains intact. The Saudis have been deeply unenthusiastic about President Zelensky's so-called peace plan, which, as I've said previously, is not really a peace plan. Obviously, the Saudis do want to maintain good relations with the Europeans. Why wouldn't they? But I have to say that I think it is a stretch to believe that they would potentially spoil their currently excellent relations with the Russians by agreeing to sell shells to the Europeans that would then be transferred to Ukraine. Perhaps that is what the Saudis will do. But I have to say I think it's unlikely. So if the plan is to buy shells from the Saudis, I suspect that this request will get a brush off. The comments from the Saudis following Zelensky's visit were reticent, to say the least. And frankly, I don't think the Saudis are enthusiastic about this idea or would welcome it. So that's one possible place where the Europeans might be coming for shells. The other one is Sudan, which has been, of course, involved for about a year now in a bitter civil war between the Saud Saud Sudanese government and um, a militia force. Uh, a, a civil war which, for the moment at least, seems to have subsided in terms of actual fighting. 
but which um, remains, so far as I can tell, at a certain level of stalemate. Anyway, a most extraordinary story has now surfaced. It's not a story, apparently it is fact, that last year when the Sudanese military government was apparently under a lot of pressure and the Sudanese military leader felt that he was at risk of being surrounded by militia forces in the Sudanese capital of Khartoum. He called on, of all people, President Zelensky for help. And Zel President Zelensky responded by rushing Ukrainian special forces to Sudan to help the Sudanese military resist the um, militia force. And again, the explanation is that Sudan has large stockpiles of shells. Now, so Sudan has in the past received military aid from Russia, and indeed before that from the Soviet Union, though that was a long time ago. And it's quite likely that it has a significant stockpile of shells, specifically 122 millimeter shells. President Pavel apparently talked about 300,122 millimeter shells also being available. And it could be that those shells are in Sudan. And it might be the case that the reason Zelensky sent Ukrainian special forces to Sudan is because he was hoping, or he is hoping, and the Europeans are hoping, that the Sudanese might be willing to part with some of these shells, or perhaps all of them, and sell them to the Europeans, who will then pass them on to the Ukrainians. The problem is, again, one has to wonder what sort of condition most of these shells are in, and whether they really do exist in these sort of quantities, and if they do, whether the Sudanese are prepared to sell them. Sudan has good relations with Russia, and the Sudanese military has just come out and said that they have no objection at all, and would in fact be pleased if the Russians did indeed go ahead and establish a naval base in Sudan on the Red Sea. That's been a topic that has been discussed rather a lot in over the last few years, the story of the Russian naval base on the Red Sea um, is one that comes up and then goes away. I can't help but think that what we're looking at here is the Sudanese receiving a request from the Europeans for all of these shells, and the Sudanese saying to themselves, well, this is a nice opportunity for us to get some leverage with the Russians. We're going to reopen this topic of the naval base, and we'll see what the Russians have to offer, and we will decide between the Russians and the Europeans as suits us best. Of course, Russia is a much bigger and better position to intervene in Sudan if it chooses to do so. The Wagner forces have been very busy in Africa for some time. I have no idea what the Russians intend to do. But already again, this particular plan, if it really is focused on Sudan to acquire 300,000 shells there is looking more complicated. Anyway, we'll just have to wait and see what happens. But I personally, and for the record, think it is most unlikely that the Europeans are going to get the full complement of 800,000 shells that they're talking about. And I suspect that if they do get shells, it will be at a very high cost and probably not in the condition that they perhaps hope.
Anyway, let's go back to President Macron's idea and perhaps President Pavel's idea of sending troops, European troops, to Ukraine. Because the Kremlin has now issued a further warning about it. And the report comes from TASS, the official Russian news agency, and it reads, West plays with fire, Kremlin spokesman says about the idea of sending NATO troops to Ukraine. And then we read that uh, Peskov, we read the TASS uh, statement saying this, the Western countries are playing with fire when discussing the possibility of sending their troops to Ukraine. Russian presidential spokesman Dmitry Peskov has told the media he described as dangerous the very fact such an idea was mentioned by French President Macron. Peskov said that Moscow is hearing many contradictory statements from the West about sending NATO troops to Ukraine, but the very fact of this discussion is dangerous. He pointed out that Macron's statements to the effect that a discussion should begin on this score came amid speculations that the West wants to see Russia suffer a strategic defeat. They are all playing with fire, Peskov warned. He added that together with German officers' discussions of strikes on Russia, all this leads to a further degradation of the situation. Of course, this is extremely irresponsible behaviour, Peskov pointed out that Moscow was keen to achieve its goals and that Russia is open to diploma political and diplomatic ways of achieving them. Well, that's what they've said before. But the point is the Europeans are playing with fire. And the clear warning is that if the Europeans go ahead with this, there will be retaliation from the Russians. Those European troops, those NATO troops or EU troops, in Ukraine will find themselves under attack if they do decide to go to Ukraine. Now, moving on, we have seen a possible first example of what the Russians might do. Now, over the last couple of days, I have discussed at some length on this channel, the successful Ukrainian sinking of the Ivan Kotov patrol ship. And this was carried out by a multiplicity of water drones, <laughs> launched apparently from Odessa. Um, it's widely acknowledged that they are British designed and that the British may be exercising a role in operating them, and of course the targeting data almost certainly is coming from the West, and I've heard from one source that they um, are manufactured in Romania, which is what I personally still tend to think. There are different sources said actually that they're manufactured in Britain itself. I still tend to think most probably it is Romania. But anyway, moving on. Yesterday, a number of very strange incidents happened in the Odessa area. Firstly, President Zelensky visited Odessa, and he was, part of the time at least, accompanied by the Greek Prime Minister Kostas Mitsotakis. This is, by the way, particularly infuriating for the Russians, who've had or so they thought, a good relationship with Greece. And I will say, speaking as a Greek, that I'm saddened by the position the Greek government is taking. And I know for a fact that most people in Greece are not happy with it either. But put that aside, Mitsotakis was in Odessa, and some of the time he was with Zelensky. Now, the Russians, over the last couple of days, have been launching multiple 
drone and missile strikes on Odessa. And one of them happened while Mitsotakis was there, and it happened within close proximity of Zelensky himself. In other words, of this convoy of vehicles, which included Zelensky and Mitsotakis. Now, that might have been inadvertent, or it could perhaps have been a warning to Western leaders to stay away from Odessa. Um, recently, there was another incident where um, Annalena Baerbock, the German foreign minister, was in Odessa, was planning to travel to Nikolaev. The, it was then noticed that her um, movements were being monitored by a Russian drone, and she took the decision, with perhaps her Ukrainian handlers and her German guards took the decision that this is becoming dangerous, and she turned round and drove away. Well, Mitsotakis has come to Odessa, and perhaps the Russians who are now able, it seems to me, to conduct strikes with almost pinpoint precision. Well, it could be that they carried out this strike as a warning to European leaders and Western leaders that Odessa is not a safe place for them. Alternatively, it might have been wholly inadvertent. I don't know. But anyway, that was one incident, and it is the incident that has attracted a lot of attention in the Western media, unsurprisingly. But yesterday, the Russian Defence Ministry, on its Telegram channel, published this statement. By the way, it's another one of those curious statements that appear on the Defence Ministry's Telegram channel. This, again, has not been published, so far as I can see, on the Defence Ministry's website, and there is no allusion to this incident in the various updates, daily updates, that the Russian Defence Ministry provides about the military situation. There is some kind of information control going on on the part of the Russian Defence Ministry that I don't wholly understand. And anyway, it is irrelevant for this discussion. Anyway, this is what the report said. And as I said, it appeared yesterday. At 11.40 Moscow time, the armed forces of the Russian F Federation delivered a precision strike at the hangar of Odessa Industrial District, where Ukrainian militants, that was Ukrainian troops, special forces, call them whatever you like, trained to deploy uncrewed surface vehicles of the armed forces of Ukraine. In other words, water drones. The goal of the strike was achieved. The facility was destroyed. Now, there are lots of reports circulating about this incident, none of which, as far as I know, can be confirmed, all of which, however, um, are appearing, you know, various chatter. And firstly, it's been suggested that this is a retaliation for the strike on the Ivan Kortov. It may have been, but I think this was connected to the Ivan Kotov incident in another way. And this is based on claims which I've heard and seen. Dima at the Military Summary Channel discussed this, these claims at length. And this supposedly is what happened, which is that whilst he was in Odessa, presumably meeting Mitsotakis there, amongst other things, Zelensky also decided to visit this hangar. And he went there supposedly in order to decorate the Ukrainian controllers of these water drones who had launched this attack on the Ivan Kotov. <laughs> 
and the Russians were keeping careful track of Zelensky's movements. Their drones, and drones can be extremely difficult to see, and probably the Russians by now have developed drones that are especially difficult to see and track. Anyway, their drones were keeping track of his movements, Zelensky's movements, whilst he was in Odessa. And as a result of his movements, they will have identified the building he visited where he was providing, giving the decorations to the people who had carried out the strike on the Ivan Koltov. They then waited for Zelensky to leave. Zelensky left, went back to Kiev, and then the Russians carried out this strike. And again, some reports suggest that it was carried out by a long-range missile. I'm not sure, and I'm not going to speculate of what sort. So, a tough incident here. Um, and note that it is about water drones. Now, there's a lot of speculation as a, that this was the control station for these water drones. Perhaps it was, but note that that's not what the Russian Defense Ministry say. They say that it was the place where um, Ukrainian operators of the water drones were trained to deploy them. So, who knows? But there are rumors that a lot of people were killed in this strike. Ukrainian operators, Ukrainian trainees, perhaps Western operators, perhaps Western trainers. Again, Dima at the Military Summary Channel was talking about how airspace to Romania was closed, suggesting that bodies of people killed in this incident were being evacuated to the West. Perhaps others were being hospitalized. I'm not going to pretend that I know exactly what happened here. We have this bare statement from the Russian Ministry of Defense. And, well, that tells us quite a lot by itself. It could have been revenge by the Russians for the Ivan Kortov, but I think it is more likely that they were aware that Zelensky was in Kiev. They probably keep a very careful track of his movements. I believe they've even released drone footage showing him, um, making it clear that they are able to see him wherever he is. This is apparently done in order to refute stories that they've been trying to assassinate him. The Russians are making it clear that they would be able to assassinate him at any time if they chose to do so. Anyway, um, anyway, the point is that they knew he was in Odessa. They probably knew what he was likely to do. They kept track on his movements. They found that he'd gone to this location. They'd probably been searching out to try and find this location for some time. Having Zelensky expose its whereabouts in this way then gave them the perfect opportunity to carry out the strike, which is then what they proceeded to do. That, it seems to me, is the likeliest example of what has happened. Now, bear in mind this, if it is true, and I don't know that this is indeed true, that there were Westerners in this building, it's highly likely that the Russians knew that they were there, and the Russians, in that case, carried out the strike on, that, on this building. 
And perhaps that was also intended to reinforce the warning that they're now giving to the West. Anyway, let's move on and let's now turn to the situation on the front lines. Yesterday, there were lots of reports that the Russians have made very significant progress in the Zaporozhye area, that they've captured large numbers of fields in Bradley Square, and that they now control the western and southern parts of Rabotino. There are also reports that General Sirsky is rushing reinforcements to the area um, and preparing a counterattack. Riba, in fact, even claims that General Sirsky is, is planning to restart Zaluzhny's failed summer offensive and is going to want to have the Ukrainian troops advance once more towards Tokmak. I, I find that extremely difficult to believe given the realities on the battlefield at the moment. Rybar, it seems to me, does have a tendency sometimes to overstate things, and this is one such case. He continues to insist, for example, that there is fighting on the Krinky bridgehead. I think pretty much everyone else acknowledges that the Russians are in full control of that bridgehead. I say everyone else. Of course, the Ukrainians won't admit that. But I do think that sometimes Riba is too willing to heed what the Ukrainians say and um, probably has a, a somewhat, shall we say, exaggerated view of their capabilities and their intentions. But anyway, there we are. On the claim, the specific claim, that Sirsky is redeploying troops to the Robotino area in order to stem the Russian advance and to counterattack there. That is almost certainly true, and um, it is consistent with what we know of the way in which Sirsky conducts military operations. Um, I would also add that he's said more negative things about one of the commanders, a I believe his name is General Schmigal. He said that he asked General Schmigal for explanations of things, and that General Schmigal was not able to provide clear explanations, and it looks as if this particular general is another general who has now been sacked. It's part of the ongoing purge that President, Zel uh, President Zelensky and General Sirsky continue to conduct of the military as they replace all of Zaluzhny's people. So, ongoing fighting in Zaporozhye, but it remains, so far as I can see, the lesser theatre. The bigger battles are taking place elsewhere. And again, there was intense fighting yesterday in the Avdevka sector. The previous day, the Russian Defence Ministry claimed that 500 Ukrainian troops had been killed or wounded in Avdevka. Um, yesterday, they said that 460 men had been, Ukrainian men had been killed or wounded in the Avdevka sector. They also spoke about a tank battle between an American Bradley tank, an American Abrams tank, and a Russian T-72. They said that the T-72 knocked out the American Bradley, sorry, the American Abrams tank. So it looks as if another Ab Abrams tank has been knocked out. This apparently happened in the intense fighting that is taking place in Berdichi, which clearly remains contested. But the main reports of the Avdevka sector talk about a big Russian advance in Orlovka. This appears to be acknowledged by Ukrainian sources as well. It looks as if Orlovka is about to be captured or perhaps recaptured by the Russians. It looks as if the Russians are now in the process of cutting the supply roads. They capture Orlovka. They're in a good position to cut the supply roads. To Torninka, another contested village further south. From the map... <laughs> 
again, bear in mind, I'm not an expert in these things, but from looking at a map, it seems to me that if Orlovka is captured by the, Ru by the Russians, um, then not only Tonenka, but Berdichi also become, in effect, undefendable. So it's understandable that the Russians have focused on Orlovka, and if this is all correct, and I suspect it probably is, and Orlovka is indeed likely to fall. It looks as if this particular defence line that the Ukrainians have created around Toninka, Orlovka and Berdichi is likely to collapse and that Sirsky's counterattack did buy the Ukrainians some time but at enormous cost without ultimately changing the situation on the ground. In fact, some of the best units of the Ukrainian army have been badly mauled in the fighting. So that's the situation in Avdevka. There's lots of news from other parts of the battle lines as well. Firstly, in the Marinka area, south of Avdevka, it looks as if the various claims that the Russians have been advancing in Georgievka, the village that lies between Marinka, one of the two villages that lie between Marinka and Kurachovo are true, and that the Russians have made significant progress in bringing Georgievka under control. And it looks as if the Russians have indeed established a significant foothold within Krasnogorovka, this town to the north of Marinka, and that they are um, steadily gaining control of this small town, which is being bombed relentlessly by the Russian Air Force with a level of intensity that resembles that which we recently saw in the battle for Avdevka. So it looks as if the Russians are in the process of breaking through Ukrainian defense lines. In the Avdevka area, they look like they're likely to capture Orlovka soon, and they're making further progress in Georgievka and in Krasnogorovka. And there is now a widespread consensus that the Russians are close to completing the capture of the big village of Novomikhailovka to the south of Marinka. They apparently control most of this village now. The Ukrainian positions in the village are becoming increasingly insecure and unstable. And of course, if the Russians do succeed in capturing Novomikhailovka, a largest, largish village of, I believe, 1,400 people at the time of the last Ukrainian census, which was, by the way, I believe, something like 25 years ago, just saying. But anyway, a largish village. If the Russians do capture Novo Mikhailovka, that puts them in a stronger position to start cutting supply lines to the important fortress town of Vugladar, further south, which has been the linchpin of Ukrainian defense in southern Donbass. So, a difficult situation for Ukraine on that part of the front line. And it looks as if a continuing difficult situation for Ukraine in the Bakhmut area as well, with very fierce fighting continuing there and with the Russians continuing to make advances, apparently, in um, um, Ivanivska. Supposedly, they now control perhaps 60, 70% of this village, and they're continuing to bomb 
Ukrainian positions in Chasofya relentlessly. It's been suggested that the Ukrainian forces there are being all but flattened. <laughs> well, we shall see what takes place over the course of these battles. Now, I'm going to say one other thing, which is that um, there have been lots of reports over the last two weeks or so that the Russians have captured two villages in the Liman area, um, Makaevka and Tierny. There's been no confirmation of these claims from the Russian Defense Ministry. And I understand there's no video evidence to support these claims either. The Russian Defense Ministry does talk about fighting in Terni specifically and has done so, but it's never provided confirmation that either Makaevka or Terni have been captured. Probably, I'm guessing, there is still fighting going on close to these villages, and I suspect that some of these claims are somewhat premature. Anyway, there we go. So the fighting continues. I want to say again, looking at all of these Russian advances, looking at the way the Russians continue to hammer Ukraine, Ukrainian forces, right across the front lines, it might appear as if we are looking at a full-fledged Russian offensive. But the Russian Defense Ministry has never spoken about such an offensive taking place. I don't believe that this is, in fact, a major Russian offensive across the contact line. There may be an offensive being prepared in the Avdevka sector. The fact that the Russians are starting to break through Ukrainian defence lines, such as they are, places like Orlovka, and presumably when they move on, move on up the railway towards Ocheri Tenia, there's some re reports that they've actually resumed their advance in that direction also. Um, perhaps at that point, once the entire Ukrainian defence system such as it is, uh, apparently there are very few Ukrainian defences between Avdevka and Pakrovsk, the big Ukrainian town, well it's not particularly big, but the Ukrainian town, or the Donbass town, west of Avdevka. Anyway, once these defence lines have finally been cracked, perhaps the Russians will advance through and move on towards Pakrovsk, or perhaps, perhaps more plausibly, the focus will be in the north once um, Chasov Yar is captured. There's suggestions that Chasov Yar is on higher ground and that the town of Konstantinovka and Kramatorsk itself are on lower ground, and that if the Russians do gain control of Chasofya, that will put them in a strong position to shell Ukrainian forces and to overwhelm Ukrainian forces um, to the west in trying to defend these towns, Konstantinovka, Tinovka, Kramatorsk. But anyway, um, all of the fighting that we're seeing at the moment it still seems to me that at times it may look like it's going beyond aggressive attrition. But overall, aggressive attrition is what it continues to be. And of course, what is also happening is that in the absence of proper defence lines to the west of Avdevka, it looks as if the Ukrainians, as I discussed in my programme yesterday, are obliged to send more and more troops to fight the Russians on the combat line because 
realistically, they don't have proper fortified lines to fall back to. So, very bad situation continuing on the front lines. Ukrainians still absorbing major losses and perhaps, possibly, a Russian attack on a facility in Odessa which the Russians knew was being used by Westerners as well as Ukrainians. I'm going to finish this program by making one very last observation. All of this military activity in Krasnogorovka, in Novomikhailovka, in the fields around these places, in Bakhmut, in um, Avdevka, the push towards Orlovka and all of that. All of this is happening now in the first week of March. Now, I had understood that the March, late February, March, is the Rasputitsa season. And, of course, I remember many people telling us a short time ago that operations would slacken off during the time of the Rasputitsa. The Russians had only a limited amount of time to complete their operations before the Rasputitsa brought operations to a stop. Well, if the Rasputitsa has indeed come, it doesn't seem to be holding the Russians back very much. Perhaps, unlike the Ukrainians, they found ways to deal with it. There are lots of claims and comments from Russian soldiers about how much better adapted their vehicles are to the landscape. Who knows? I'm sure lots of people do. I'll be interested to know what people have to say about that. Anyway, that's my programme for today. More from me soon. Let me remind you again that you can find all our programmes on our various platforms, Locals, Rumble and X. You can also support our work via Patreon and Subscribestar. Links under this video. And last but not least, please remember that you can go to our shop and if you've liked this video, please press the like button and check your subscription to this channel. That's me for today. More from me soon. Have a very good day.